Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Dr. Will Mayo on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here's our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The story we're about to tell you took place 74 years ago in Rochester, Minnesota. August 23rd, 1883, to be exact, it was a Tuesday. What happened there that day affected every man, woman, and child in the United States. Eventually, it affected the entire world. It's the unusual and highly dramatic story behind the founding of the world's greatest medical center, the Mayo Clinic. It concerns a doctor, a nun, and a tornado. Now, here is Frank Goss. There are Hallmark cards for every day in the year. For every day in the year is made happier by a Hallmark card. Not only the special occasions, anniversaries, birthdays, and holidays, but the Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays of everyday living are made brighter, richer, when you send a Hallmark card. Because a Hallmark card says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And on the back is that identifying Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with MGM, who celebrate their 30th anniversary at your favorite theater with their new Technicolor production, Rhapsody, starring Elizabeth Taylor, Vittorio Gassman, John Erickson, and Louis Calhoun. And now, Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. <laughs> The man's name was Dr. Will Mayo. The woman's name was Sister Alfred. And their life and yours was affected by a tornado. What is a tornado? Where does it come from? How does it start? Well, here is the factual account of one tornado, exactly as it happened many years ago in Rochester, Minnesota. August 23rd, 1883, Tuesday, 2.55 p.m. A cold mass of air, which had originated over the great northwest territory of Canada, crossed the western tip of Lake Superior, traveling in a south and westerly direction. At the same time, a warm mass of air that had formed over the Gulf of Mexico four days before floated across the scorched fields of Iowa, driven by a gentle south wind. This warm air mass, laden with moisture, clung low to the surface of the earth, while the cold air mass was dry, and therefore high in the sky. Considering velocity and direction of the winds, any weather observer of the day would have safely calculated that there was no chance of the warm air meeting the cold air. To a lay observer in Rochester, the weather was merely hot. 3.18 p.m., the train station. Uh, too hot. Uh, too dang hot. Oh, don't let a little heat get you down, Mike. Uh, it isn't right to ask a man to work on a day like this. It isn't right to ask a man to work any day. But a man has to work who wants to eat. You better get back to your loading, Mike. I told you, it's too hot, even for an Irishman. Besides, I don't feel good. I'm going over to see Doc Mayo. What do you want me to tell the boss if he shows up? Tell him he's crazy for being out in this heat. And tell him I'm sick. I 
wonder. I just wonder how hot it is today. Three thirty five PM. According to the best available records, the temperature reading in Rochester on that day reached a peak of 93 degrees at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. A slightly unusual reading, even for an August day. Residents of the area expected relief from the stifling heat long before nightfall, since they were accustomed to the cooling air which blew down regularly from the north. And in a convent on the outskirts of Rochester. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is... Yes, sister. I'm sorry to disturb you, Sister Alfred. Oh? You did want to drive into the city today. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for reminding me, sister. Is it any cooler outside? I'm afraid not, sister. Shall we go? I'm ready. ask a question? Of course. Everyone's noticed that you've been very preoccupied for the last few days since His Excellency called. Sister, are you feeling well? I feel fine, sister. But I am worried. And I've been wanting to discuss it with someone. His Excellency mentioned the possibility of our founding a hospital here in Rochester. A hospital? Yes. I'm afraid he was somewhat disappointed in my attitude, sister. Because I couldn't honestly agree to an undertaking of that nature right now. Raising the money for such a project would be an overwhelming burden on everyone. And who would agree to help us with such a task? I know, sister. But there is no hospital in Rochester, and the town surely needs one. These last few days, I've been offering all of my prayers for divine guidance. What would you name such a hospital if you build one, sister? I'd call it St. Mary's. <laughs> what is it, sister? Apparently, you've received some guidance already, sister. Yes. But as I said before, there are so many factors to be considered. I just can't undertake the responsibility. I'll just have to leave the final decision up to God. Four thirty-two p.m. The sun was scheduled to set at six forty-three p.m. Central Standard Time. One hour and 50 minutes before sunset, the warm air front passed over the historic old city of Fort Dodge, still advancing steadily northward. 4.42 p.m. The original course of the cold air front was altered by a stiff wind from the east, doubling its velocity and steering it to a position west and north of Rochester. Because of this wind and increased velocity, a meeting of the warm air front and the cold air front became inevitable. And in the office of Dr. Will Mayo, Sr. Where's Doug Mayo? Oh, I suppose you mean my dad. Well, he's out in the call right now. How about your brother, Will? I'm afraid he's out with the patient, too. I'm Charlie. I'm a doctor. Can I help you? Uh, I don't know. You're just too dang young to be any good at it. A man ought to be a doctor a long time, you know what I mean? Having the same old trouble, Mr. Mudigan? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I hurt here and here mm -hmm. and here. I, I don't sleep or eat so good either. Say, um, how do you know about my trouble? How do you know my name? I helped my father take care of you in your last um, trouble, Mr. Mudigan. Uh, it was the 4th of July, right after the picnic. How much do you drink these days? Oh, uh, enough, you know. Mr. Mudigan, what did my dad prescribe for your troubles? Well, he, he told me to quit drinking. Has my brother Will ever treated you? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he told me to quit, too. Mr. Mudigan, quit. Oh, no. Honestly, you'd, you'd feel a lot better if you didn't drink so much. Oh. Sorry I'm late, Charlie. I got held up. Dad, Will? Hello, son. Well, hello, Mike. How are you feeling these days? Awful, Doc Mayo. You know what? He just told me... Charlie, he probably told you to quit drinking, Mike. And he's right. You know, Mike, the sooner you come to terms with John Barleycorn, the better off you'll be. No. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Mudigan? Yeah. 
You can get this barometer of yours fixed. Huh? Look at it. Bust it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you hitch up the buggy, Charlie? All right. We'll see you at home, Dad. We have to drive over to the slaughterhouse to pick up some specimens. All right. Hmm. Not a breath of air stirring. It's funny. This barometer's always worked before. I've had it here in the office for years. Well, what does it say, Dad? It just doesn't fit, son. Not in this kind of weather. It says storm coming up. <whistles> now I ask you, just take a look out that window. Do you see anything like a storm? 6.05 p.m. A storm was in the making at a position approximately 60 miles west of Rochester where the advancing warm air front made rendezvous with the advancing cold air front. When the warm air rose over the colder air, the movement caused the winds to blow in both horizontal and vertical directions. This action resulted in a circular motion, approximately 300 yards wide and 25 miles in length. A tornado. And now its destination was determined and in the center of its path, Rochester. In just a moment, the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Yesterday, I conducted a one-man survey I think you'd like to hear about. I was looking through the selection of Hallmark cards, hoping to find an Easter card that said specifically, to my niece. Well, it turned out that my only problem was to choose which card I wanted. And I decided to see just how many Hallmark Easter cards there are for different members of a family. Do you know I found specifically designed Hallmark cards for everyone you want to remember? Not only for those closest to you, but for aunts and uncles, in-laws, cousins, faraway relatives, frequently overlooked, who get a special thrill from being remembered. And what better time is there to send a message to those dear to you than at Easter? You can share the warmth of the season with your friends, too, by sending them Hallmark cards that say affectionately, to a dear friend at Easter time. So stop tomorrow at the fine store where you buy Hallmark cards and select these personal Easter greetings. The thoughtful messages and the hallmark and crown all show that you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Dr. Will Mayo. <laughs> Listening to the story behind the founding of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It's also the story of Dr. Will Mayo Sr. and his two sons, and of a nun named Sister Alfred, and of a tornado. The account is true, just as it happened, late on that summer day back in August of 1883. p.m. The sight of the cloud and the sound of the wind were still indiscernible to residents of Rochester. In the railroad station... I'm sorry, Doc. What's the matter, Todd? I'm not getting any answer on the line. Seems to be dead. Mm. Think there's a chance it just melted down in this heat? (laughs) (laughs) It could be. I was hoping to get this message in tonight. More supplies, Doc? Yeah. If I can get it off tonight, they could start here in tomorrow's train. Uh, Well, I'll tell you what'll do. I'll send a man out to check the lines. I don't think it'll be too long before he finds the trouble. Why don't you just leave the message with me, and I'll see that it gets off as soon as possible. Well, all right, Todd. That's very kind of you. Thanks. Uh, Don't worry, Doc. Anytime. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, uh, Doc. Yes? Did Mike come in to see you? Oh, yeah. Same old trouble. (laughs) I thought so. Probably outlive us all. <laughs> Good night. Hey, Good night, Doc. <sighs> Might as well keep trying. Six. 
6.20. The dangling funnel of the tornado whirled over the waving grasslands, now only 32 miles west of Rochester. A lone farmhouse, a bridge, and the desolate wreckage of an ancient buggy disappeared in the cloud, emerged a moment later unharmed. However, one object had been gorged into the vacuum and hurled a distance of 400 yards. A shattered telegraph pole. Six twenty-two. A country road. This is getting serious with me, Will. Every time I go out on a sick call, I have to put my foot in the door when they see it isn't you or Dad. They all think I'm too young to practice medicine around here. The other day, when I went to see the Talmadge boy, it was a matter of arguing. Uh, how is the Talmadge boy, Charlie? Not good, Will. Not good at all. I'm sure. I can perform an operation in a kitchen, and the, and the prognosis can even be good. But, but it should have been done in a hospital. And that boy should be recovering in a hospital. Well, you know, Dad's talked about having a clinic or hospital here for a long time. So have a lot of people. But we still don't have one. Yeah, but most people don't realize the need. And it costs money. Lots of money. And they're losing propositions most of the time. They wouldn't be if the public were just a little more informed on the values of antisepsis and surgery and trained nurses. If Dad could just find someone to work with, someone with his enthusiasm. <laughs> what is it? Charlie, look over there. Huh? Ever seen anything like that, the way those clouds are hanging above the ground? No, never. Well, never saw anything like that. It's a storm, Charlie. Oh, I guess it is. Mm-hmm. But the air... Seems there should be a little breeze or something if that's a storm. It's just as quiet as a tomb, Will. 6.25. The tornado was unidentifiable 12 miles out of Rochester. Compacted of conflicting winds and electrical activities, the sound was, for the most part, confined within the funnel of the storm itself. For this reason, it was seen before it was heard. One huge dark cloud rising about a mile above the earth, trailing a single weaving black trunk that reached down to the ground much as an elephant's trunk hangs loosely when not in use. This trunk or funnel contained enough energy to lift a locomotive clear in the air and carry it a distance of 30 yards. Oh, sister, sister. Why, yes, sister? Where is everyone now? They've all gone to chapel for evening vespers. Go to the sacristy. Tell Father O'Neill there will be no evening vespers. I don't understand. Look out there. Once before, when I was Mother Superior in Winona, I saw a sky like that. Sister, there's no time to lose. I want everyone in the basement as quickly as possible. Yes, sister, I'll tell them right away. Tell them all to go down to the basement. And hurry, sister, hurry. Yeah, we're Charlie. Hello, Mr. Muller. Who? Who? Well, hello, Mr. Muller. Now we're going to meet you at the slaughterhouse. Yeah, sure, but we've closed for the day. We close early. Everybody go home. The storm over there. None of them want to be caught in it, so they leave early. It's come up fast any minute. You two boys better get home before you caught too, yeah? Well, a little rain won't hurt us, Mr. Muller. It's not a little rain, Dr. Charlie. Lots and lots of rain. Some wind, too, I think. Maybe worse. Mijo, you two boys go home now. Go back tomorrow. Go to home now. Well, I guess there is something in the air at that, if it scares old Muller. Yep. Will. Hmm? Listen. Hear it? What is it? Good Lord, look at that black cloud now. It's rolling right toward us. Another minute, it'll be over the whole town. Well, they see it, too. Hold her, Will. Hold her. I'm trying. Look out, Charlie, the buggy. Will, we're going over it.
9.35. There were many witnesses to the tornado of 1883 in Rochester. Each of them told a tale of surprise and horror. They remember, for instance, the grain elevator which toppled down over the tracks on Broadway. They tell of railroad track which was ripped up and bent as though it were picture wire of homes that were moved and tacked from their foundations and settled hundreds of feet away. They remember rooftops and buggy carts and even whole buildings rising in the air and disappearing forever. But they remember most vividly, however, that where once there was sereneness and quiet, there was suddenly devastation and death. Get that lantern over here and hurry up. Easy, easy, lift him out easy. You get on one side, I'll get on the other. All right, now watch what you're doing. You better not move him until the doctor looks at him. Yeah. Come on, all right. Handle that man gently, gently. Keep him wrapped in the blanket. He's got to be kept warm. Dad. Charlie, Will, you two all right? We're all right, Dad. How about you? Oh, not a scratch. I guess we're all lucky. But there's no telling how many have been hurt or how many have been killed. Doctor, doctor, doctor Mayo. Yes? We found a man over here. I think he needs your help. All right. Where is he? Where those men are holding the lanterns. He was crushed, I think. Come on, boys. All that terrible night, Dr. Mayo and his two sons worked, caring for the dying and the injured. By morning, a temporary hospital had been established in the local dance hall. And there, amid the aftermath of tragedy, a meeting took place. I'm Sister Alfred, Mother Superior at North, Lady of Lords Academy. Hmm? Oh, excuse me, Sister. Outside, they said you were in charge of the temporary hospital. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Mayo. Did you have much damage over there, Sister? Oh, we were very fortunate, Doctor. No damage, no one hurt. Good. I came here to see what I can do to help. We need nurses, sister. Full-time nurses. Some of these people here are pretty badly injured. There are nearly a hundred sisters at the academy. We're at your disposal, doctor. Good, good. I can't tell you what a relief that is, sister. All of the women in town have been trying to help, but they have families of their own to take care of. Oh, uh, these are my two sons, Sister Alfred. Dr. Charles Mayo. Good evening, sister. And Dr. Will Mayo. How do you do, sister? I feel in good hands. Sister Alfred is going to handle our nursing problem. And I'll make arrangements right away. You know, Sister... Yes, Doctor? We should have a hospital. We've always needed a hospital, Doctor. Not just for disasters like this, but for every day. Well, it takes more than one man, Sister. The people must want it, though. The money must be raised. Doctor, I can raise enough money. You? And the other sisters. If you... And your sons will run the hospital. We'll build it. You seem to have thought about this a great deal, sister. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about it. I know we can do it, doctor. Together. Just a little while ago, I left the decision up to God. It seems he has decided. And from the waste and wreckage and death, Dr. Will Mayo, with the help and encouragement of Sister Alfred, gave the strength, courage, and resolution to build St. Mary's Hospital, the forerunner of the Mayo Clinic. For God had given a sign. the greatest tribute of appreciation that was ever paid to parents was when the Mayo boy said the biggest thing we ever did was to pick the father and mother we had. Uh, well, how, how much such words mean. But how often do we let people know our feelings? Now, that's one of the purposes of Hallmark cards. Yeah? 
And one of the reasons you'll find they always make the receiver so happy. In just a minute now, we'll tell you about our story for next week. In the meantime, here's Frank Goss. When you hear about the Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe, do you visualize sturdy stand-up dolls in colorful costumes? Well, you're completely right. But they're more than that, too. These Hallmark dolls are also story books, for they open up and printed inside is the doll's story in verse. There's Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, Peter Piper, 13 other favorites, and each rhyming story has a delightful new twist to intrigue youngsters. For example, did you know that Polly put the kettle on and let it burn dry? And that's why we now have singing kettles to warn little girls? And nowadays, people count sheep when they can't sleep, all because little Bo Peep couldn't sleep until she counted her sheep. <laughs> Till it seemed that the spider who frightened Miss Muffet away and ate her curds and whey got a severe stomach ache, which proves it doesn't pay to be greedy. <laughs> Can you imagine any doll or book that brings so much combined pleasure to children? And these ideal gifts cost just 25 cents, with an envelope for mailing. There's also a collector's album at 50 cents that holds all 16 dolls. Stop soon at a fine store where Hallmark cards are featured and see these loved Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore. Next week, an exciting story of piracy in the Hawaiian Islands. It's a true account of Captain Thomas Catesby Jones, the naval officer who sailed to Hawaii and thereby was greatly responsible for an event taking shape in Congress today. Hawaiian statehood. And our star will be Mr. Van Heflin. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Prue. Our script tonight by E. Jack Newman. Featured in our cast were William Conrad, Virginia Gregg, Herb Butterfield, Harley Bear, Faith Gear, Lee Millar, Vic Perrin, Jack Moyles, and Will Wright. Special music by Jerry Goldsmith. And remember, the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday when we bring you a stirring true story. If the million American boys and girls serving in our armed forces overseas and the two million others in training in this country could talk to you tonight, they'd probably say, it's tough to be lonesome. And there's nothing lonelier than a mail call without your name being called. Don't forget the boys and girls you know who are in the armed forces. Let them hear from you regularly. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you until next week at this same time when you'll hear a true story from the life of Captain Thomas Catesby Jones starring Van Heflin and on Easter Sunday, the story of Lydia starring Miss Helen Hayes on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.